I invite you to close your eyes for a moment, maybe open your hands towards heaven in this posture here. He's been singing these powerful lyrics, declaring truths about God. And this living God is present here through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Longing to touch us at the deepest part of our very beings. I want to give you about 30, 40 seconds or so. Just like this. And maybe in the deepest part of your soul, you're saying, speak, Lord. I'm listening. Lord, open our eyes that we may see what you want us to see. Open our ears that we may hear what you want us to hear. Open our hearts that we would receive every gift from the Holy Spirit this evening. We offer this time to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, amen. What a gift. What a gift. Like I said, if you're not singing you're missing out on an opportunity to double your prayers. Uh, As St. Augustine said, the person who sings prays twice. And so if you want to double your prayers, start singing. What a gift to be led into an awareness of the presence of God and singing. And my hope is that that awareness would continue as we look into God's word tonight. Tonight we're looking at a topic that you will have to wrestle with for the rest of your life. It's something that will determine your, uh, the way you operate in the kingdom of God, the way you relate to God and relate to others. I'm talking about humility, and humility is such an important virtue. It's actually what many people call the gateway virtue, that if you get this right, everything else begins to flow. It's the gateway virtue. And so we're going to look at humility tonight, and we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. You can follow on the screen, follow in your Bible or your phone, but hear the word of the Lord. Philippians 2, verses 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and on the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Bless us tonight, Lord, as we hear your word proclaimed. Amen. 
Humility, humility. When I think about humility and the ways that I have been challenged to grow in it, I think about an experience I had in which I did not demonstrate any humility at all. I remember preaching my first sermon at New Life Fellowship Church at 29 years of age. It was my first sermon there at the church where I serve as the senior pastor right now. And being uh, my first time preaching, I was very excited to preach before the congregation. And so I preached the message and I did the pastoral thing that pastors do after the service. They wait in the lobby and they shake hands with people waiting for compliments. We don't acknowledge that. We don't confess that, but that's what we're doing here. And so I'm shaking hands, and the person says, oh, what a great word, Pastor. I said, amen. The person said, oh, that encouraged me, Pastor. I said, praise the Lord. Oh, I've never seen the scriptures like that unpacked. Well, th thanks be to God. And, and everything, we were having a great time. And then my, my predecessor, the guy who was a senior pastor at the time, said, hey, Rich, could we chat about your sermon for a second? And I thought, why do we need to chat about my sermon? Well, what's going on here? Evidently, there was a tradition that they have in that church that between the two services, they go to the side and talk about ways that they could strengthen the message for the second service. I was not aware of this arrangement. And so he says, can we talk about your sermon? And so I'm already defensive. I mean, I just preached the word of God, man. What do you want to say about this? And so I get to the corner and he goes, you know, Rich, good job, but do you know what you can do? And my initial response in my head was, do you know what you can do? Uh, get out my face. That's Rich could do. And so I didn't say that. I said, what, 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 what can I do, man? What can I do? And he said, you did this well, but if you change maybe this, this could help out. And I was so defensive. Who is this guy? I know he's the pastor, but who is this guy telling me? what to do right after I preached it. And I learned in that moment how difficult it is to be humble, to confess that I don't see everything the way that I think I see it. And it was an ongoing lesson that I've had to learn over and over and over again. There's something so beautiful about humility, and yet it's something that is often beyond our grasp. And at the same time, it's something that God is calling us to pursue every single day. Humility. It's one of those virtues that, it's interesting, it's paradoxical. Because it's one of those virtues that's gained by not seeking it. And, if you th and when you think you have it, you actually lose it. That's the nature of humility. It differs from other kind of virtues and character qualities. You know, if you, if you say to someone, you know, I'm feeling more loving. We go, well, praise God. I'm feeling more generous. Amen. I'm just feeling, just, you know, just feeling, uh, I, I want to pray, praise. But if you say, you know what, I'm feeling really humble. Uh, it just doesn't sound right. You know, humility has just been flowing through me recently. It's just like, oh, I, I, I just don't know. Because once we think we have it, we often lose it. And it's, it grows in us when we do not seek it. it it's, it's a paradox, and I'm going to unpack it for us. One of the most powerful things about the scriptures and the things about Christianity and the things that Jesus shows us, it shows us what God is like, and what Christianity shows us is that God is the most humble being there is. This is what's staggering about Christian faith, that God is the most humble one. Usually when we think about the attributes of God, the characteristics of God, we say God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, God is everywhere, and of course God is all those things. But what makes Christianity stand out and different than everything else is it proclaims a God who's more humble than any other being in the universe. And this is what Paul is seeking to unpack in Philippians chapter 2. Paul is happy with this church that he's writing to. And it's interesting because when you read Paul, he's a grumpy guy. He's not always happy with the churches he's writing to. When he writes to the church at Galatia, he begins with some customary greetings, grace and peace, all that rest. And then how could you desert the God who called you? I mean, he gets right into it. But in Philippians, 
one of the key words that come up over and over again, it's joy, rejoice. Paul seems to be genuinely happy with these people. And the reason he's happy with these people is because he's writing to them from jail. And they have supported him. They've been a good friend to him. They've DM'd him when he needed them. They, they, they sent him uh, donations. I mean, they, these people have been connected to him. And so Paul rejoices that they have been so supportive. But even though they're doing good work, Paul hears certain things and wants to encourage them into greater faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And this is a good reminder for all of us that just because you're doing right in one area doesn't mean all of life is going right for you. Your relationships might be right, but your finances might be wrong. Some area of your, of your life might be right, but another area is wrong. We all have growing to do. There's always some place where we can take the next step in. And this is what Paul is getting at in Philippians chapter 2. He's trying to encourage this community of people into greater faithfulness to Jesus through the language of unity. And so in the first five verses of the chapter, take a look at this. He tells the church to be united seven times. Seven times. In the first five verses, be of one mind. He's saying all these things. But when Paul talks about unity, it's important to say that unity for Paul does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean everyone thinking the same thing in the same way. Everyone looking the same. Believe it. He's not, he's not talking about uniformity. He's talking about something entirely different. And that's important to see because there's places in the New Testament where the church does not see everything the same. And that is normal, the normal human experience. On this campus, you're not going to see everything the same. On this campus, there's going to be disagreements. On this campus, there's going to be tensions. On this campus, just like everywhere else in the world, there's going to be conflict. And the question is, how do you deal with the conflict? How do you deal with the tensions? How do you deal with the disagreements? How do you deal with the unsettling realities of what it means to be in human community together? And so Paul is trying to get at how do we stay connected? And in essence, this is what Paul is saying. Our unity is based on our ability to cultivate the humility of Christ Jesus. I start rapping from time to time. I used to be a rapper, and so stuff starts coming out and rhyming like that, and, and so it just comes out. Our unity is based on our ability to have the humility of Christ Jesus. And that is what Paul is inviting all of us into today. Now, Paul needs to encourage them because he's hearing that there's two phrases that's dominating his church. Number one, selfish ambition and vain conceit. He's saying, I'm hearing this stuff about selfish ambition and vain conceit. It's a way of self-seeking, that the world is oriented around me, that I'm centered. My life, my experience, the way I see the world, I'm the center of the universe. And Paul is saying, this is some kind of vain conceit, this selfish ambition. It's a way of being so self-oriented and this happens in small ways and in big ways. I know what it's like to live a self-oriented life. And you know what it's like to live a self-oriented life in big ways and in small ways. For example, whenever you are in a group photo and you see the picture for the first time, where do you look? You're looking for yourself. Correct? Correct? And if you look good, do you like the picture? Sure, right, you like the picture. If you're the only one who looks good, do you like the picture? Even more so. <laughs> if someone has broccoli coming out of their mouth and they're all busted up, and, but, but you're looking good. You say, let's put that on the, let's frame this one. Let us frame this one. This is my profile picture now. And we have a way of just living life self-oriented. That the world revolves around me. And what Paul is saying is, is not that our interests are not important. He's not saying that we're not thinking about our own goals, our own hopes, our own dreams. 
But what he's saying is we are called to value others, to esteem others. And in a community, if we're all doing the same thing of valuing others and esteeming others, what's going to happen is your needs are going to be met. It's this kind of cyclical relationship of you first, no you first, no you first, no you first. And that's what Paul is inviting us into. And what Paul is getting at is, if we're going to live into this reality, we must focus on our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's where we get some theological and some gospel goodness. In verse 6, Paul tries to give expression to what it means to be humble. And he says, you want to know what humility looks like? Look at our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 6, he he speaks out and writes what's known as the Christ hymn. That scholars believe that this was a song that was sung in the early church to remind them about the story of Jesus. And so Paul says, being in the very nature of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And what Paul is doing, the first thing Paul is doing is he's saying, what is God like? I'll tell you what God is like. God is like Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. And if you want unity in your relationships, you want wholeness, you want healing in your relationship, look at Jesus. And the shock of Christianity is that Jesus reveals God to be a servant. Verse 6 is really powerful because the word being there, the word being, 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 it, it, it's a powerful key to understanding the scripture. There's a, a, an American theologian named Michael Gorman, New Testament scholar, and he's done some work in, uh, on, uh, in this passage here. And he says that the word being can be translated in one of two ways. It could be either be translated although or because. Both of them work. Although he is... God, in very nature, he he did not consider equality with God something to be taken advantage of. Although he is God, he becomes a servant. It's very nice. But he says it can also be translated because. Because he is God, he shows himself to be a servant. In other words, Humility is not the opposite of divinity. Humility is the very expression of divinity. You want to be like God? Be humble. In becoming a servant, Jesus reveals what God is like because God in God's very essence is a servant. In John 13, we see this so beautifully demonstrated in Jesus. In John 13, Jesus is about to go to the cross and he's gathering his disciples together. They're going to have a meal. They're going to have a celebration. They're going to remember the three years. They're going to talk. He's going to train them. He's going to teach them. And in John 13, we see something happen where these disciples are around the table and some foot washing needs to take place. Now, let me tell you something fascinating that I've discovered by researching and hearing some scholars talk about this. In ancient times, whenever someone would come into a home, remember, there are now paved roads, there's dirt all over the floor. If it, if it rained or what have you, your feet are muddy, uh, smelly, all the rest. Usually someone would have a servant who would be at the door cleaning everyone's feet as they walked in. But if you could not hire a servant or did not have money for it to have a the first person who entered into the party was often the first person who was responsible for cleaning feet. And so, of course, everyone was fashionably late. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'll, I'll be there in 30 minutes. Uh, I'm in traffic. Uh, and so here they are around the table with dirty feet. No one has taken the initiative to wash anyone's feet. And I love what Jesus does in this moment. Jesus doesn't say, all right, guys, Take out your iPhones. I want you to take notice of this, take pictures, take notes. I'm going to demonstrate humility. I'm going to show you what humility looks like. Make sure you tag me in this post. He doesn't say it at all. What he does is he very simply gets up, takes a towel, 
a basin and begins to wash the feet of his disciples. All of their feet. Even Judas, the guy he knows who's going to betray him, he washes his feet too. Now, if I'm Jesus, I don't know if I do this. If I'm Jesus, Peter, man, Peter, I know you're a hothead, man, but I love you, man. I wash your feet. John, John, oh, you're just, man, you've been with me, John, and me. Wash your feet. James, James, is oh, man, you just, uh, remember that time we were, oh, James, I wash your feet. Bartholomew, uh, why did your mother name you Bartholomew? I don't know, but we just got to hear it out. Just, uh, Judas, that later for you, Judas, right? And then we go to the next person here. I would have left Judas. But Jesus washes everyone's feet. I apologize if there's a Bartholomew in the house here. I apologize. All right? <laughs> he washes everyone's feet. And this is the nature of God who knows everything about you. And washes your feet. He redefines greatness in this very moment. The question is, how do we live into this reality? How do we begin to cultivate humility in our own lives? How do we live in the Jesus way? And what I want to do is I, I want to give you some handles here, some ways to think about cultivating humility. That if you can grasp this today and begin to wrestle with this, something will be deepened in your soul and you actually find yourself living freer. First thing I want to tell you about humility is this, that humility is a decision, an ongoing decision that we make. Humility doesn't happen simply because someone prayed for you. You know, there's certain virtues that you don't, you, you don't get them as just like in that moment. It's something that's worked on every single day. Every single moment is an opportunity. And so I just need to remind you, first of all, if you're like, I'm still struggling with this, this is an ongoing decision that we make. That just because you've lived a long life doesn't mean you're humble. I know a lot of 60, 70, 80, 90 year olds that are not humble. Living a long life does not mean you're going to be humble. It means you're going to have to give yourself over and over again to committing yourself that humility is a decision. Secondly, humility is essentially a letting go of entitlement. I'm letting go of entitlement. Now, if there's anyone who has the right to feel entitled, it's Jesus. God, the living God. And yet, Jesus lets go of any sense of entitlement, and this is a struggle for me and will be a struggle for you. That I deserve special treatment. And in various ways, it gets manifested in our lives. I'll tell you one way it manifested in my own life. When I became the pastor at New Life uh, at 29 years of age, um, I had an interview. They said, congratulations, Rich, you're hired. Oh, by the way, you can no longer park in the church parking lot. And I was like, excuse me? Now, I have to understand we're about 1,500 people. There's only 50 parking spots in New York City, in Queens, where we're at. Not in all of New York City, but in Queens. So, sometimes it feels that way. You're hired. You can no longer park in the church parking. I said, where am I going to park? They got to figure it out. But I'm the pastor. They said, this is how we do it here. We've always done it this way. We save those parking spots for visitors. We save those parking spots for the elderly. We save those parking spots for families with young kids. You got to figure it out. Now, I'm, I'm thinking, but I'm the pastor. Shouldn't pastors have their own parking spot? All right, all right. Uh, is somebody going to drive my car for me and park up? No, no, no. You're going to have to figure it out yourself. And everything inside of me was so angry. Why am I being treated this way? And yet, for the last 13 years, every single Sunday, do I like it? No, I don't like it. <laughs> when it snows, do you think I like it? When it's raining, do you think I like it? But it's good for my soul. I just know it's good for my soul. And so humility means letting go of any sense of entitlement. Humility also says, thirdly, that there's nothing beneath me and no person beneath me. There's no task that's beneath me 
and there's definitely no person that's beneath me. A good and simple way to measure humility in your life is to honestly identify the tasks that you think are below you. You'll get a good sense of how humble your humble rating is. If you say, I'm not going to do that, that's beneath me. You're getting a good sense as to what humility looks like in your life. I recall uh, when I was 18 years old, I was working for this company, this municipal bond company in New York. These people made hundreds upon hundreds, millions of dollars. I was in the mailroom. I was the mailroom guy, lowest end of the spectrum, the totem pole there. And I was always just like, man, these people don't treat me right. They don't, you know, all, all, and, and, and so I get to the lobby one day in this beautiful floor, shiny, and I see a piece of trash on the floor. And I'm by the elevator, I press the button, and I see the trash. And I look at the trash, and the garbage is like right, the trash is like the trash can is right next to it. I could just go, huh, huh. And I look at that and say, I'm not picking that up. That's why I'm not picking that up. I'm already low on this, this company. I'm not picking that up. The CEO, a guy in his upper 70s, comes he waits at the door, and he knows me. He goes, hey, Rich, you see that piece of trash? I go, yeah, I see the piece of trash. He goes, if you see the piece of trash, just pick it up. And then he made me feel real bad because he took him forever to pick up the piece of trash. It's just, just, it's just going down. Just, uh... <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is, this is terrible now. I'm just feeling really awful about this guy. And he picks it up. And to this day, I have not forgotten that encounter. And when I see trash, I can't help but pick it up now because I was so convicted from that day. And humility says there are tasks that we think sometimes are beneath us. And even worse, we think people are beneath us. But humility says there's nothing and no person that's beneath me. Number four, humility says I don't have to project an idealized image. We have a way of curating our image before the world. We do this in so many ways. We, 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 we want to project an idealized version of ourselves. And humility says, there is no such thing of you living into your idealized version of yourself. They were all broken and weak. And the quicker you can recognize your own brokenness and your weakness, the faster humility will be formed in you. I think about there's a desert father saying, one of my favorite sayings. It should be on the screen. It says, Abba, Abba John, who was a wise man in the desert community, was sitting one day in the midst of the brothers who were asking him about their thoughts related to faith. He gave a reply to each one of them when another old man said out of envy, John, your soul and everything about you is full of poison. That's a fight on my block. Then he says, Abba John replied, you're actually right, brother. That's exactly what's in me. And you make this observation because what you see on the outside, you would say much, much worse if you only could see what's on the inside. He's saying, you, you think I'm all messed up? You're just seeing me on the externals. Man, if you knew my heart, you think this guy is something else. Humility says, I'm not trying to live according to an idealized version of myself. I'm broken. I'm weak. I'm in need of mercy of God. That's humility. And here's the last thing I want to mention. You want to cultivate humility? Begin to confess these words. I am not the Messiah. I am not the Messiah. The world is not held up by me. The world is held up by Christ. I am not the Messiah. The reality of our world is, and our lives, is we often carry burdens that we cannot sustain ourselves, thinking that we are Messiahs, little Messiahs. And we are invited tonight to be reminded there's only one Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the sooner we can recognize that we are not the Messiah, the sooner we can take down the burdens that we're carrying. Some of you are carrying burdens tonight that you have no business carrying, that you can give it over to God.
because he's the only one who can handle it. When I, when I, when I mentioned last night or so that I had lymphatic tuberculosis and I thought I, my life was coming to an end and I, I thought things were really bad and I came across a verse in Colossians 1.17 that said, Jesus Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together. In him, in him all things hold together. That has become my life verse. In him all things hold together. And when I thought about that verse, about Christ holding things together, I thought about something that I've seen in Manhattan. In Manhattan, there's a statue of, of Atlas holding the world on his shoulders. Holding the world on his shoulders. And some of us, we're feeling like that right now. You feel like you got the world on your shoulders. So much you're carrying. Anxiety, fears, responsibilities, things happening at home that's stressing you out. And you feel like you're just carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. But what's powerful about this image and where it's situated in Rockefeller Center is that Atlas is actually facing St. Patrick's Cathedral. And it's a beautiful picture. Atlas holding the weight of the world and facing the church. But there's an even more delicious juxtaposition where inside of the cathedral there's another statue behind the altar, another statue that contrasts life with Atlas. Atlas is holding the world on his shoulders, but behind the altar is another statue of the boy Jesus. Put that up on the screen. The boy Jesus holding the world in his hands. First grade Jesus. Chicken nugget eating Jesus. Juice box sipping Jesus. Disney Junior watching Jesus. Effortlessly holding the world in his hands. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. The invitation for all of us tonight is to say, I am not the Messiah. And one of the ways that we confess we're not the Messiah is by saying, I need help. I can't carry this alone. I need help. So many of you have been suffering alone. You have struggles that you've never confessed to anyone. Burdens that you've been trying to carry in your own strength. You know what you need? You need to say tonight, I'm not the Messiah. I need help. Some of you have been struggling with addictions since you were 12 and 13 years old and you're trying to figure this thing out on your, by yourself. Tonight you're saying, I'm not the Messiah. I need help. Some of you, you were raised in a family in which you had to be the responsible adult at 13 years of age and you're the one who has to hold the family together and you're saying, I, I can't do it anymore. I need help. I am not the Messiah. I need what a wonderful way to end tonight with a confession. I need help. And so this is what i like us to do. I want to invite our prayer team to come forward. And we're going to have just a, like we did last night, a few songs of just of worship and responding. And as we're led into song, some of you, you need help. You've been living a life of holding on to burdens that you cannot carry alone. You need someone to walk with you, to pray for you, to encourage you. And tonight's a night where you say, I'm not the Messiah. I can't hold my life together. Man, I need help. I'm tired of struggling alone. Lord Jesus, we need help. We all need help. One of the ways that we give expression to humility is by simply saying those words, I need help. I'm tired of struggling alone. I'm tired of living a double life. I'm 
tired of living a life of secrecy. I need help. I need someone to share this burden with me. I need help. And the faster you can confess those words, brothers and sisters, the faster you can be set free by the living God. Lord Jesus, free us tonight. Free us tonight. Cultivate humility in us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's just sing in response. And as the Lord leads you, feel free to come up and ask someone, I need help. Could you pray for me? Amen. I give myself away. Give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I surrender all to you, everything I give to you, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. So from my heart 